what we're hoping to do, we've been talking about um, Evansville and our region opening back up. Um, I know that Tara's been on the radio show with me, but I know that in, within a week you can have some change happen. So we thought it would be wonderful if you could give us a perspective of um, what's happening in the business end of things and opening, how are we being safe, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then I also want you to talk about um, some of the really wonderful adaptive changes that the chamber has gone through, um, innovative um, community building changes that are bringing people together around a lot of these topics. Is that an okay lead, lead in? But you- I Okay mean, for me, how about you, you Ellen? <laughs> Sounds talk great. You want to. And then um, I will let you two decide who's gonna talk in between. And then what we do as people have questions, they may be putting that in chat. Um, I'll try to watch that with Denise and let you know. And then anyway, it'll be fun. Okay, are you ready? Sure. Okay, this is Miss Tara Barney. So okay. it's nice to be with you all today. And yeah, I think this is a pretty informal conversation, but yes. I would like to just start off with how we got where we are now. Because, you know, we all watched the news when things started in China. So we knew something was coming. We didn't know what the process or the impact. And it's fair to say that um, the COVID um, need to be attentive to our businesses and our community uh, hit us all off the side of the head pretty hard. Uh, so as that happened, you know, um, our elected officials and our business leaders uh, right away said, what are we going to do to make sure that we are um, not just um, letting this thing pass through us, but making sure that we're, we're doing all we can to uh, enable our business community and its employees, because I always like to connect the dot between businesses and their employees and families and the people that live in this region, because it's all one and the same. So the, the chambers are usually seen as associations of businesses, but I see us as associations representing a whole bunch of people that are um, workers and, and leaders and investors in our region. So the, the quick uh, communication is what, what we've been doing all along, which is running a pretty good organization, I'm gonna speak for Ellen's, running two pretty good organizations. Um, and how could we take the heft that we had in those organizations and stand it up to address what was coming our way? And so we made a, um, a, a literally an overnight shift to take uh, our website and the way we usually communicate and to open the aperture wide up, you know, wide open. So we said, we wanna make sure that we're doing what we do well for every business in the region, not just our members, not just those that we work with all the time, but every business that's employed in some aspect of commerce in our region. So with the help of, you know, Steve Schaefer and lots of people on this call, we, we kind of triage what the most critical needs are. At that time, the needs were very significantly, what's closing? How's that gonna be handled? Uh, what are our restaurants doing that suddenly can't be in business? Uh, what about all the people that are going on unemployment that are looking for another option? And you know, we had a lot of businesses that needed people very quickly. So we, we shifted our area of work temporarily at the time to saying, let's make the, our websites, our website, the Southwest Indiana Chamber website, a portal for all the business serving organizations. So I sat down with the coalition and with Gage and called Alan and said, we have one, it's ready to go. Um, let's not own it, let's all use it. And so for the past three months, we've been funneling to that site, all the tools that the business and civic community need for business serving purposes. And I, just make a sidebar here because how we support the more social service needs of our community, our colleagues at United Way were doing the same thing. So we thought we can't, we're not good at being everything, but between United Way and we, we thought we could pretty quickly make a shift. So it's been a interesting path because now if you go to our website, it's doing the same thing. And God bless our members because they said, right on, go for it. Uh, there was no, oh, we pay you the money. We wanna control what's there. It was do what's good for this region. So now our, our website is shifted. So it's not as much about what's closing, but it's the stories of how we're reopening and the tools we need to reopen. So um, without getting ahead of this conversation, because I'm gonna lob this ball to Ellen, now we're, we're uh, thinking very strategically about what we've learned and what our organization needs to look like in the future 
to be um, able to stay in this space that we feel has become uh, highly useful and important as we help our region to get back back on track, to quote Governor Holcomb. But you know, Ellen's been, uh, I think, taking very much the same approach through the lens of the other half of our region. So, you know, Indiana and Kentucky, we're a region. And it's really important that we um, make sure that our eyes are on both halves of where our people live and work. Ellen. Well, I, I, I agree. That's, uh, that's one thing when Tara reached out and she said, how can we do this together? Here are the resources we have. Um, we had just split from Kindle, so we were very new, but many of the things that we've been doing have been very fluid, much like Tara. We first had to look at it and say, all right, what exactly is it that we can do for our members, more than just our members, to the community? Because we realized that there was a greater sector that needed assistance with, uh, and us learning, and we had to be that clearinghouse of information for the PPEs, the PPPs, and the EIDL loans. So everything that came forward, we were like, okay, so we're gonna take it with a fire hose, and then we're gonna sprinkle it out to the people. So that's what we did, and we continue to do that through many of the information. I had a call, actually someone came in yesterday and still had questions about an EIDL loan and whether they should take it and what should go on. Mm -hmm. So it has, that issue and need has not passed. Um, there is still that there. There's still many of the questions about uh, reopening and what some of those guidelines are and what am I going to do if I cannot open? There's so many questions mm -hmm. among them that uh, I just feel their pain. And then you still have the common questions for advocacy, um, on businesses that are having issues as far. Then we throw in um, the social issues that are having, that we're going through right now. So there's a lot of conversation. So we've started kind of a community conversation. There's also the training opportunities. Mm -hmm. I love what Tara's doing in giving these resources. Zoom, go to meetings, all these things. These virtual meetings are a wonderful way to train. I love the opportunities that, um, even Louisville is sending us information on wonderful free training opportunities um, for self-improvement, business improvement, leadership improvement. I love how we're all working together and I love the fact that um, Tara is sharing much of that information with us. They have the resources, they have the talent, so we can utilize that together and then we can also concentrate on those areas that are uh, more focusing on more of our rural area instead of more of the urban area. That well, was a lot. And, and just to add a perspective to that, you know, one of the things that uh, has been a, a, a great colleague to the South Indiana Chamber for years is the, uh, the Small Business Development Center. And, it, you know, we've hosted that, that partnership for years. But honest to God, over the last year, we figured out how to really enable each other. So we've learned so much about the tools they have and the expertise they bring. And they are like, they're the triage partner in this whole thing. So as businesses have uh, you know, surprise, instead of having $100,000 of revenue, they've now got 10. How do they adjust? Uh, we've got a great tool that is helping so many businesses stay afloat until they can get the, the federal tools and make the adjustments they need. And shame on us if we have this you know, taxpayers are paying for this resource, and the last thing we want to do is kind of hide it under a bushel. So uh, I happen to know they don't care if the business is in Kentucky or Indiana. They're happy to help. <laughs> that's so, right. Uh, I think that's one of the, um, the lessons coming out of this for us as a, as a community-serving organization that we've got to embed in, in our culture going forward, and I think we're very committed to doing so. And I, I agree. I think that is one of the things that we've realized the nonprofits need quite a bit of help because they do help so many members of this community and they need our support as well on, because so many of their, the fundraising opportunities, so many of those things got canceled. Mm -hmm. So all their funding opportunities, but how we can support them and, and their needs. And then also the community as a whole, I can tell you, there's probably uh, several calls that I get and they're not members, yep. but you know, we certainly help all those members. So, you know, the chamber is supported, um, but we are here for the whole community. So I'm glad that we can do that and we can be that clearinghouse. So I'm just looking around at this group of folks on the call and a lot of you have been guiding and contributing to this community for many years. 
And I think one of the things that Ellen really need right now is your coaching, your guidance, your perspective, because the, the real conversation for our organizations is going to be, how do we help our members understand that their investment in this kind of work is contributing to growing an economy so that they can make more money and do more business and become the organizations they're trying to grow into? Because um, we, we can't, we're not going back, we're going forward. We're going to go forward, we're going to make this a stronger, more inclusive conversation. But we're really only going to do that when we get some good coaching from a whole bunch of names and faces I see on this call. Hey, everybody. I mean, I'm hearing Tara kind of ask questions of us. So how are ways um, that, that, that we can help the chamber on both sides of the, the river um, be more connected? Acted more engaged and our people be more engaged with them mm -hmm. so that we're looking for that greater good or that that vision of, of a incredible community um, of course whenever there's big change there's also big potential for transformation and innovation so um, if you've got ideas of how we can come together or if you've got questions for either one of these ladies please please um, say so or raise your hand so we'll know and I'll call on you they can utilize that chat box, right, Lynn? Well, and I was gonna say, yep, that. because I hate dead air, um, one, of the, <laughs> one of the big enlightenments for me during this process has been the, the use of town halls. You know, we've been able to um, engage with so many businesses in, in a particular sector, one at a time, through this town hall notion of just uh, being able to see faces and kind of dragging out what's going on in the restaurant world what's the pinch point? Uh, manufacturing in our market is thriving. Uh, that's not to say it's not impacted by COVID and by everything else going on in this world economy, but people have been going to work in the manufacturing sector. So they have different challenges. They're, but they're all uh, begging for help figuring out childcare, for example. So uh, one of the uh, real epiphanies for me has been how we can use this digital forum as a way to really open up conversations. And that's why I never feel bad about looking at people in the face. I mean, I've been on two calls with Cindy Staples today, so I know what she's doing with her day. <laughs> and, and I'm really interested in making sure that we are kind of pushing for response, coaching, opinions, uh, gaps from everyone we can have, you know, kind of a conversation with here. And no, I didn't mean to pick on you, Cindy. <laughs> no problem at all. <laughs> hey, Lynn, Karen Whitehouse has her hand up. Good. So, Tara, thank you. I work for the IU School of Medicine here in Evansville, but I've been working from home since March 12th. And, that, and that's working out well. But what a new model, though, for many of us who are continuing to get our job done, but we're doing that from home. Yeah. Um, so that I think is something that's going on in our conversations is for those of us that can, we are right now success at home. So will we continue to do that? And they're starting to ask us, what are the pros and cons? And I think you might feel, might find some other offices that, that that's some of the things that are going to be um, coming up as well. Even a hybrid, we, we call it a hybrid where we, we, we're not having so much face-to-face. -face. We have several um, people that we work with that have maybe issues that being with other people right now with COVID um, might be dangerous to them should they get the illness. So it might be a hybrid where we would meet for some meetings face-to-face -face right now with social distancing, but then other times work from home and we are about to Zoom out. I mean, my team and I meet every day on Zoom, lay out our day and then stay in touch throughout the day. But I think that's something that we won't be the only ones. I think other universities and maybe some other, you know, in education I know is something that we're looking at. So there's so much to this. But I really applaud your efforts to try to help everyone. I used to be the executive director of the Vandenberg County Medical Society, and we were membership driven. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you want to help everyone, but you also Gotta need find members. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But we, we were, I was not obviously, you know, there during the pandemic, but I will say that it does create quite a bit of goodwill mm -hmm. 
when you set that aside and help everyone because it does help everyone and they will see the value <clears throat> yeah. of chamber membership. So um, anyway, be thinking about you as you as well as all of us make our way through this. So maybe Ellen and I should be talking about standing up a little webinar on remote work. Not because we have the answers, but as a way to kind of call out what's working and not. That might well, be and I actually think that when you talk about that, I've had um, one group approach me about, you know, the cybersecurity and actually, you know, yes. working at home and making sure that your computer is safe and the information is safe. So very, you know, very important for mm -hmm. all of us working at home to make yeah, sure. Yeah, we're looking that at that happens. right now because this ransomware thing is a big deal. Yes. Internationally right now. And we are um, active actively working to line up some expertise on that. Uh, yeah, it might not be local. I love it when it is local, but uh, to make sure that we're alerting people to, you know, making sure they're setting up security because you're right, when you're working remotely, there's other ways to get into that company's server than there, there were when everyone was showing up. Well, and thing. also, you know, opening those emails and, and I did it right. at home, something opened up and now I'm getting, you know, some terrible spam and you know cleaned up yeah. is, is a mess so it, it, it is important to know so i'm putting this on my list of things that we should Ellen and i should um, <laughs> add to our our programming that we're standing up that's right yeah ellen tara have you heard from people that there's a surprise that that people are able to work from home and really are very productive like yes. maybe it was different from what we thought i know the le staff I mean, we're debating now whether or not we will keep an office mm -hmm. because we have done so well. Um, now we have the ability to light anywhere. I mean, we can, we, we're connected to so many different companies and places mm -hmm. to find a place to meet is just not a problem. Yeah. But um, be more unique, plus we're a small group. But how has that happened with other people? Have you heard whether or not some people prefer it and some people don't like it? Well, um, I think that a lot of us have learned to work from home very effectively. Mm -hmm. I, I'd be the first to say working at home was something I did when I had to. Uh, I've learned to be productive at home myself. So I'm kind of a type A person, you know, I need to be around people. So I do a lot of walking because I got to do something. Um, but I think that uh, quite a few people have, have raised the value of working at home as being something that we ought to build into our model going forward. Uh, in, in the companies I've talked to, I'm guessing Ellen's hearing the same thing. I, I'm hearing much of the same thing. Yeah. There's those that can work at home, um, but they're understanding the challenges of if they've set their office up, say in their dining room or their kitchen, that it's then not allowing them the break they need. So then yeah. there's that, that mental bog down. Mm -hmm. So some have said, you know, I've had to make adjustments. I have to make sure that I've actually put my office in an office space and I take the time for lunch and I take dinner. So I think there is the challenge to make sure that um, it's done properly. I have others that say, you know, I am so much more productive at home working at my job because I am able to get the things done. I'm not taking as many breaks. So, so one of the I, things that I, I wrote a kind of a letter to our members, which got published in the paper two weeks ago, mm -hmm. and it included kind of four projections. And one of them is, you know, every time a lease comes up in our market, and probably markets all over this country, there's gonna be an assessment going on. Yeah. So what happens with office space is gonna be very interesting to follow because I think a lot, a lot of people are gonna be evaluating that. I think tons of people are gonna be watching what goes on in the business meeting space. So there's, there's gonna be some material changes in parts of our economy that we're gonna to have to get our heads around and not be surprised by. And, and those are two, and I think another one is this whole space of work and distance work. Um, so those are things that are gonna require a lot of good heads coming together and making sure yeah. that we um, think about for the benefit of our region. Tara, Ellen, one of the things that I've just noticed from having lived downtown for so long and trying to make this the best, most thriving downtown, and I know Henderson is doing great things, mm -hmm. um, and then I thought about, wow, if the office space, some of it becomes available, we don't have enough housing. I mean, could we yeah. move those offices into really cool apartments mm -hmm. and get more people living downtown? So I'm always one of the, I think, okay, if there's space, how do we make it better? And I'm thinking, 
there might be some cool things where there's offices on a few floors and then apartments above. I see that a lot in Nashville and some other places. There could be real opportunities for coolness in this. Well, that's what I love about this group. We should be thinking about what we can do with the opportunities that come our way. Yeah. And that's a perfect yeah. example. Yeah. And I, I think there are great opportunities. And like you said, Evansville has a, or Evansville and Henderson has mm -hmm. a thriving, you know, downtown with lots of buildings available. Um, but in that space that can be used creatively. Well, and what do you think about brainstorming? Um, all right, so, so COVID's going on. We've had some other situations that were really tricky. Some of these heartbreaking situations um, with, with, with African-American members of our mm -hmm. communities and of our, our country and our world. So when I think about how we have fared, I mean, I, I hate to sound like this, but I don't care. We've done real well. I mean, we I just was at the most beautiful march on Sunday that we marched and we sang and we prayed and we hoped for better things and we were determined and 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 that was that was beautiful and our and our situation with COVID has not been as extreme. Is this not a time for us to say to the outer world, hey guys, if you're gonna do a company, if you're gonna do an innovative new restaurant. If you're going to move somewhere, um, how about here? How you know, about this region? You I make mean, a good point. There's a lot of people, I've, I've heard people say that actually um, the more rural areas, which I consider us, even though Evansville is certainly, you know, more metropolitan than Henderson, is that there is going to be that desire to move into a community um, that is less, and I don't want to say volatile, but certainly um, more opportune, opportunistic to, to grow. And um, to thrive individually, to thrive um, in a family. And, I, and I'll, I'll just add my two cents here because I do think that um, we've got some specific advantages right now. Um, but I also think that we've got, and one of those is we're respectful and we listen um, better than other places I've lived. And I think that's a huge advantage because it opens the door to where we still have a lot of work to do. Yes. Because if we are going to grow in the world economy, we do have plenty of opportunity to, to, um, to stand alongside our African-American friends and make sure that we are continuing to make a lot more very specific, deliberate progress. Because that's the community that, that smart 21st century uh, talent is going to choose to live in. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is, it is, um, it would be uh, folly to not continue on to do very deliberate work. So I am thrilled with how the last couple of weeks have gone here. I think you make a great point, Lynn. We've demonstrated that we can listen and we can support. What's going to be really important is that we learn and make change because and, uh, and it's um, we are still far from being able to um, have confidence that we are not just embroiled in systemic challenges as lots of other parts of our country. But, but you're right, we've got a, a nice, we should have our welcome mat out right now. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I think we've got some, some leadership that is also saying, um, certainly our mayor and Steve and um, different people and, and across the river that have said, it isn't perfect, but we're willing to listen, we're willing to make changes. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, there's some real honesty, I know in the, in the leadership retreats that we have, we talk very honestly about some of the really difficult things that happen in our past and then make um, direct decisions on inventory and what we don't want anymore, where we want to go for our vision. So um, just to let the group know, we're talking about doing those kinds of discussions specifically around minority and race issues. So I invite everyone to stay tuned and to join that. Certainly both chambers. I know, um, I know where Tara's heart is. We've had many conversations like Alan. So like to me to make real change, um, there's not gonna be any way that the change is gonna happen if only the minority people and just a few others are trying to make that change. This has to be where people that, that have um, the ability to say this stuff happened and it's still happening and it's wrong and as white people and as a people 
with a certain amount of privilege, we're saying this is not acceptable anymore. So bringing all of that together and being willing to make changes together, um, I think it's the only way that we can make real and lasting sustainable change. And I agree with what Tara said, without it, um, our community just doesn't stand out the same as if it does because we need to do the right thing because it's the right, right for the right, but it will also benefit everybody in our community to, to be making those decisions together. And that's one of the things that we've had those conversations just kind of tagging on that. We had at a community station with, you know, our sheriff, our chief of police and our human rights commissioner, Charles Johnson, and uh, some of the rallies that were here. And it was like, this has sparked a conversation, but we must continue the conversations. We cannot let these conversations not happen anymore. And so that's what we're trying to do is continue those conversations. And as, as you know, Charles Johnson says, um, let's, let's talk about it, but let's also be about it. Be it and take the mm -hmm. actions we need to and take continue, to right thing. Continue the conversations. This is not a short term uh, situation, nor is it a short term, short term fix. Well, 400 it's years is about long enough, so I think the time is right. I think so, definitely. Boy, isn't that the truth? Well, and it's with anything. If, if we're going to get equality and pay for women, it cannot just be a battle that women fight by themselves. Mm -hmm. If there are if there are not people that are non women helping us, it ain't gonna happen. So it's whatever that that situation is, we need to join. And um, boy, this is the time, and the time is now. So it's really cool. How about um, the rest of the folks? Do you have any questions or thoughts? Anything Would you like me to get like this to... question about uh, PPP that Don asked? Do it. Um, because yeah, the PPP has benefited a lot of small businesses. Uh, PPP is coming through in all sizes from $5,000 to $500,000. But uh, we know that there have been hundreds and hundreds. I've got the numbers. I don't have them in front of me. I'm sorry. I should. Of uh, businesses in our market that have gotten PPP that are genuinely in what I consider small business. So, you know, the feds call a business with 500 employees small business. But I call a business with 50 or fewer mm -hmm. a small business. <laughs> and it's been uh, quite effective in getting to lots of businesses that are uh, – two people and 10 people. So um, I've got to say, I started out being very skeptical of it. Uh, I think the issues now have to do with reporting on it, but, and I'm not making any brilliant predictions here, but I think we're gonna find the federal government gets more and more flexible about how that money gets used. So I'm, I'm feeling like it's been a, it's got potential to be surprisingly important. And if you look at, if you look at the data just in the last few days, of the stock market, and if you look at our unemployment, a whole lot of people are getting back to work now, lots to go, and spending last month, which was basically PPP money, has really been critical to starting to move the market in the right direction. So I'm pretty excited about that program. Uh, Main Street's more complicated, Idle's more complicated, but, but they're all, I think, being pretty well guided by our financial institutions and our and our law firms that are working with our businesses. Yeah, I think there's a lot of um, conversation with, but it has certainly helped many of the businesses stay afloat during the uncertain times when they yeah. did not know what was going to happen. That certainly has helped. Um, yeah, and I, I echo Amy's comment. I think it's uh, nonprofits have really, yeah. nonprofits except for Chambers, we're the only ones that can get it. Right. Um, what? You know, C6s are not eligible. Um, it's a long, bad story there, but basically, the NFL used to be a C6, for example. So some big C6s that have created a complicator here, but no one on this call wants to hear about it except maybe Ellen. <laughs> so we're the only organizations that, to Lynn's point, one of the reasons that we so much appreciate this community support, we're moving to this without the benefit of PPP, unlike most other nonprofits. So. Hey, I'm going to break in there for a minute. You know, Tara, I did not know that until yep. just now. I did not know that. We are a not-for-profit, um, not considered a non-profit. Yeah. It's oh crazy. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, if there's any way that you or anybody that you know that can assist by, by helping the chamber, um, please, both of these chambers, because they've been doing unbelievable things. I had no idea they weren't able to, to take advantage of that. That's, that feels really weird to me. I can't yeah. stand that. Um, <laughs> 
Wow. All right. Let's, we will, we will keep telling Thank people you. that you all need support because that's just, that's just hard Thank to believe. You. Okay. Hey, uh, Lynn, I don't know if you can see the amazing Chuck Stinnett. Yeah. But his hand is up. I think he'd love to share something. Talk it up, Chuck. Sure. Uh, something that I think the Tara and Ellen might want to consider is um, those of you who have been working from home, uh, you probably can, can sense some psychological differences and, and emotions. Uh, I've been a freelancer working from home, home for two years, so I've got fairly deep experience with this. Um, I, I'm, I'm pl I've done a, a little bit of reading about the psychological mm -hmm. effects of people who are uh, working remotely. Uh, there's even a website, uh, weworkremotely.com. Uh, and, and you hear a lot of discussion. I also saw the, I think it was the American Psychological Association uh, had a piece back in, uh, in late March about the, the effects of working from home. You hear about a lot of uh, uh, senses of uh, mm -hmm. isolation, uh, depression, uh, franticness. Uh, some, some people feel a need to, be, they need to be working 24 uh, seven. Some people don't get the exercise that, uh, that they need. Uh, I'm happy to say I haven't personally f felt any of those effects, but I think my personality has changed a bit uh, by being quiet so much of the day, by being uh, apart from people. Uh, it, it hasn't changed me, but it, it, I mean, it has made me a different person, but um, i there are things I observe about myself. I, I don't feel like I suffer fools quite as uh, 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 happily. Uh, your, your mileage may, may vary, but I think it might be worth looking to uh, uh, some experts or some people with experience about working uh, remotely, because I think you're right. I think that people are going to be working from home a lot more, uh, but uh, maybe they need more preparation than just uh, getting uh, thrown into the deep end. Boy, Chuck, it's like you set that up. Tomorrow, we are hosting a a um, webinar on building personal and business resilience so you can still sign up on it it's just a half hour because it's meant just to say is there an issue and tell us more about that so we can stand up more specific programming so if you if you go to the chamber website and sign up for it we'd love to have you as i said it's a half hour 99 30. from awesome. it will come other more specific programming because we get this is an issue we just don't know exactly what the um sweet spots for conversation are yet so i would love anyone on this call that has a half hour to give us to join that conversation tomorrow and it will help us to do just what you're saying chuck because i think we all see this as a new horizon and we'd love to figure out what the most relevant use of your time whenever we stand this programming up it's if people want to give an hour to it it's got to be worth it to you so yeah, it, do, it does need to. Yeah, You've got course. people saying, I love it. I love working from home. And then you have those that feel isolated. So it's nice that everybody can understand that, hey, it, it's not great for everybody. And that if it's not so great, you're not alone. So here's some resources. Putting it in the chat. We had David, we had David on not too long ago. And um, there's some discussion about giving some choices. Like if you like to, to be educated at home we're going to try to meet that and if you'd rather be at school or need to be at school and I think sometimes being open to listening to your people and say what is it exactly um, what makes you happy on our staff I think Elizabeth you would probably stay working from home for the rest of your life right if she could find a cave yeah and then <laughs> Denise I don't know I don't know if Denise can take it and then I'm kind of 50-50. Can I work from home in the morning and go to work in the afternoon? You know, I kind of want to mix. But it's, um, I don't think it does affect everybody the same. Mm -hmm. um, anyway. I'm going to add I one more thing to this part of the conversation. Uh, we just put together a remote work policy for our organization. And I, I guess if there's an interest, we could certainly post that on our site too, because it might be replicable to others just to provide some um, rails on what, what we need to cover because things that businesses haven't thought of is if, if you've got business equipment at home and there's a fire in your house, have you got the liability figured out on that? And that sort of stuff, which is you know, mm -hmm. kind of the boring stuff no one wants to talk about, but we're trying to um, begin to build those tools too. Yeah. Right. I wouldn't have thought of that. Yeah, yeah. neither would I have. But Fortunately, smarter people than me that work here did. Yeah. Um, Tara, can you see Anna's comment about 
um, you know, they're staying in place until August 1st. Yes. That's amazing. And then Amy the minimum. <laughs> Minimum. Wow. And I'm like, Denise, let me out. I actually came to my grandmother's condo to work for a couple of weeks because home was too silent. Yeah. <laughs> me, girl. You and me. I, I am reading the comments and that's helpful to me. Yeah. And then Amy also said um, something about needing some help reacclimating mm -hmm. to the office and human contact, I guess. <laughs> so that's how, that's good feedback for us because I can test these questions out with other groups and then we can stand up. Um, how it goes. Yeah. yeah so at least some conversation. I'm going to say this loud and clear, and I'm looking for Ellen's face because I don't see right now. We are not the experts on lots of things. The good news is we have a lot of businesses that are, and so it's our job to not be experts when we're not, but to find you all to help us, you know, stand up a, a good Zoom conference or whatever it is. So. This is very helpful for us to reach out and figure out who can provide good content in this space. <laughs> Did you see Andrea's comment? Now that I have <laughs> child care, I like working from home. <laughs> so someone asked about child care. We have been working hard on that. It's complicated. It's, it's pretty decent for birth through five because we've got four C's and a pretty good network there, but the whole, um, school age childcare depended so much on camps and the whole inner working of, you know, that system. And it's been, it's been pretty chaotic and it wasn't as an acute an issue until people started going back, back to work because when mom or dad is working in manufacturing and, and another household partner is at home, it was pretty easy to, to muddle it through. Now it's becoming a bigger issue. So we're, we're so happy to hear the announcements about schools planning to reopen it lets us, again, funnel this. So there's a lot of good work going on on uh, a couple households sharing a nanny kind of person. Uh, there's a lot of college students that have found a, a sweet niche in this, uh, but it's it's been a very entrepreneurial uh, environment, I guess I'd say. <laughs> yeah. And then some of the stress that this has created has caused um, higher numbers of issues, not just with eating and, and having enough food, but sometimes the stress of, of not enough money, not enough food, all the kids there, maybe no work. Oh yeah. That's really a tough situation for any family um, to to deal with. So I know I know that that some of our frontline nonprofits are just doing unbelievable work trying to make that situation better. And then I wonder about our pets. I What's happening with um, with our humane societies? They a lot of times don't end up being able to get some of the grants and some of the gifts that other people do. And I bet you at a time like this, there's more animals in need too. From my understanding on, on some of it in Henderson is that at first there, was, there were a lot of uh, fostering of the animals. And then it just got, they ran out of people and more and more animals kept coming in. So... Okay. And once again, looking at the donations as well, but also fostering those animals and taking care of them. Yeah. So I think what we're hearing too is there are still a lot of places to take our passion and our desire to help to volunteer and to help um, with animals, with kids, with all kinds of stuff. So it's, um, golly, it's a heck of a time to show what incredible servant leaders we have in our two communities which is pretty amazing, really. Yeah. Um, how are we doing on questions and, and things? Are we doing all right? I was just posting in the chat, just a little few updates. Um, yeah, what, the, the trick, Karen made a good point about other professional organizations getting help. They do, unless they lobby. So what chambers are well known for is trying to influence good business public policy in state houses. And that's that's what requires us to be organized as a C6 instead of a C3 or a C4 or, you know, five other IRS designations. Right. I'm going to ask a question because I see Anna's on the phone. The thing I am interested in watching is how many more uh, people claim part of their house as a work site and an office coming out of this because I bet it's going to be massive. And it's going to be very interesting to see what, what that all means because I know I've got part of my house set up as an office now and I didn't before. Um, and I'm bet I'm bet guessing that there'll be a 
a, a big shift into how people um, claim the use of their, their home for this purpose going forward. Tara, can you have several of your accountants go on and teach us how to do that right and how we're supposed to, because I think we're all going to get, I know mine could now, I guess. I just didn't think about it. So that, you know, that's probably a legitimate um, thing to do a webinar on. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it'll be really interesting to see your comment about commercial leasing if larger companies will start actually reimbursing their employees mm -hmm. for their home office space right. in lieu of having a, a larger commercial lease. So um, there's a lot of really interesting things and changing things, as, as you know. I think, I think that's right. You know, mm -hmm. I follow Nationwide Insurance, and they uh, canceled their lease on three giant locations around the country and uh you know i don't think our real estate market's going to have that negative an impact because we don't have that those massive you know tenants of that size but it's gonna you know it's gonna be a big change and i think that you know i hadn't thought about that anna but you know frankly we send we send our employer equipment home with our employees so it's just the next step wow yeah <laughs> We got something from Luke. Is there an option to claim part of your home as an office on your taxes? This is from Luke. Yeah. And we believe yeah. so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There is now, there's some you know, legitimate conditions on it. So I'm not going to give you a uh, tax advice here on this call. But yeah, a <laughs> lot of um, people who, you know, do work from home can claim, you know, portion of their office, portion of their car, all those things that enable them to make their salary. So I, you know, again, I'm, I'm dangerously close to things I know not enough about, but I probably will by next year. <laughs> My accountant told me that it really had to be an office. Yeah. So like you can't have a bedroom and a little desk stuck in the corner and say right. that's your office. Yeah. Like it really needs mm -hmm. to be an office. Yeah. And, but I don't, I don't know anything. That's just what I was told. <laughs> well, a lot of people have converted their closets into places to do Zoom calls. So. <laughs> Very good. Anna put a good post there uh, to guide us in that conversation. Uh, it sounds like this really has the potential to become a, a, um, a Zoom town hall on how we, where this works and where this doesn't work. So I want to just, you know, make one other comment because I think going forward, um, our, our region has a lot of good things going for us. Uh, we are surveying right now to get a read on customer confidence. So if you have a minute and could go to the Chamber website and pull that survey, we're trying to help our restaurants, our event spaces, and others get a read, not just from you as a business executive, but from you as a consumer. And so if you can spread it to others in your organization that are consumers, we're trying to get a read on whether people are going to be comfortable going back for a big concert by when, a small concert by when, uh, when does the fill feel like there's going to be plenty of people sitting in the audience. Those are things that are kind of intangible. They're very localized, so we can't steal good information from other markets. So we really, this is where we really need to hear from our community uh, because our restaurants are trying to fine tune their opening and so are so many of our performance partners. So we'd love your help on that. Tara, can you put that survey in the chat so they can um, get or we, I know we have it. We can send I, it out. I can put too. our website in the chat, but I'm not smart enough to put the link to the survey in our chat. <laughs> but just so you I know, we, either. we I sent it out in our survey today. I mean, I, we sent Thank it you. out in our newsletter today. So Thank you. hopefully there'll be a lot of response. Yeah. Okay. Hey, this has been a wonderful conversation. Ladies, thank you so much. Um, uh, both both Ellen and, and Tara are just real open. If something else comes up, send them an email, let them know. But get involved with your chain active and let's find ways to partner as much as we can on any of these community thoughts and issues. So, but, but both of you, thank you so, so much for coming on. We record this. And then what we'll do is we will send this out to our alumni membership as well. And, and just the people we send stuff to, it's more than that, the voice people, everybody. So more people will get to see this than a, that are on the call. So some, we have 20, 25 people here tonight. 
but hundreds will see it when we send it out. So just know that, I hope that's okay. I don't know if I told you we were doing that. Fine with me. Oops. Good. Before we get off good, this good, call, good. and just in case Don isn't reading all the chat, I'm gonna say, I gotta keep him posting good reading material for me because he is my number one source on what I read next. <laughs> yeah. Don is amazing. Don is amazing. See, I got his attention. He might not have caught that. <laughs> yep. Okay, everybody, is there anything else anybody wants to say before we go? Tara, Ellen, love you guys. You do such a great job. We, we love having yeah. you. It's wonderful. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank okay. you so much. So great to hear from you, ladies. Thank you. Bye, friends.